KC Laboratory. Sponsored by Emprise Bank. It's the KC Laboratory presented by Emprise Bank. Look, there's more options to do banking now more than ever. Who you work with is more important than how close they are to your house. Emprise has digital banking that meets you where you are, on your phone, on your computer, or even your smartwatch. They are a trusted partner at your fingertips. They are a trusted partner of KC Sports Network, the KCSN Draft Guide. They have been absolutely wonderful to work with. I promise you, if you work with them, you're going to have the same experience that I do. Uh, I am here with my dear pals hanging out. First, find him on Twitter at Maddie underscore KCSN. Matthew, are there more legs or are there more eyes in the world? I love that he has to answer this. You're muted, Matthew. This is why we're a professional podcast. Um, we're not going to get into this. There are more wheels than doors in the world. Oh, and okay. anybody who doesn't use the front left burner more than the rest of their stovetop burners is is uncivilized. Um, listen, listen. We don't need to take, you know, subtle inside, you know, shots at Craig here. So, I mean, listen, we... We got into the legs versus eyes thing. It's clearly legs. I can explain it to you. If you're not in the KCSN Discord, I did it there. It is clearly legs. <laughs> but it, it is you know legs. No, no, that is the correct, the correct answer is legs. It is. Um, but you know what has legs? Chiefs rookie mini camp has legs. <laughs> oh, no, no, we can't go there yet. We can't go and there. And eyes. <laughs> we can't. They have eyes too. They do have eyes. Um, we can't go there yet, though. Uh, we got something else left with us. We haven't done it yet. Okay. The 2022 Chiefs draft draft has occurred, <laughs> and there is a clear winner. Kent, do you do you care to tell everybody who the, who the winner is? Uh, not really. Okay, it is yours truly, the OG winner, the original winner. the The title has come home. The throne has returned to North Carolina. I have won, and Kent, what's that thing you always say about nobody's won with two picks? <laughs> I have the most picks in the history. Well, buddy, I got some bad news for you. And let me also add, not only did I take the lead, Craig got on the board. And he got on the board! New addition to the KCSN draft team, Zach Hicks, who is a, uh, Indianapolis Colts writer and also, I believe, was at one point in time a fan of the Washington Commanders now. He got on the board in his first year with the KCSN draft guide. And Kent, get, get, did you score any points, Kent? I'm looking. I don't. I don't see any names highlighted. I'm. I'm just. I, I hate that you brought up that Zach got on the board in year one, and it took me four years <laughs> to finally get on the board. The results: Zach got on the board with Jalen Watson, cornerback out of Washington State, taken in round seven. Craig got on the board with my guy, Joshua Williams, cornerback out of Fayetteville State, taken in round four. I got on the board twice, two times, just like I'm the two-time champion of this game. I got on the board two times with George Karloftis in round one and Sky Moore in round two. In case anyone's keeping tally, that's that's Maddie with three total correct picks since we've been doing this. Kent with two, Craig with one. I would have taken George Karloftis if I had gotten to pick before. Uh, but that's that's neither here nor there. I'm just going to say. You sniped my. You sniped my. Uh, you sniped my first round pick. That I sniped Maddie's now. first round pick with Joshua Williams. Yes, you did. <laughs> no, I was going to call off this. I had a plan. I had. I had. A, I had something I was doing. I did it, and we nailed it. We got a slot receiver ish, and we got the defensive end. Exactly what I was gunning for. We need to move on to the rookie <laughs> minicamp, though. Like this is good. We got the rookies that I won the game with. We got two more guys that were guessed correctly uh, by the KCSN draft guide team. And they were all at the rookie mini camp this past weekend. Why? Yes, they were Matthew. And we were able to get a, uh, a lot of quotes, a lot of comments from, you know, about every draft pick uh, and some extra guys, uh, some undrafted free agents that we'll probably spend a little bit of time talking about here as well. Um, but just overall impressions. Was there, like off the top, Matthew, anybody that really impressed you, uh, gotten getting to hear from them over this week? Um, I think Trip McDuffie. The it, it's not, I guess, fun to start with the very first pick, but it kind of is. Um, you listen to him talk, and I think there was clearly like just another another level of a guy that gets it. I think is the best way to say it. Like you just listen to him talk, and you hear a guy that sounds and comes across very intelligent, both in life but also on the football field as it relates to football. He understands kind of 
where he's at, what he's got to try to do, what there's going to ask of him, how to work properly as a rookie. He just seems to really get it. But then he's also very engaging with not only the people asking the questions, but with the questions themselves. And I think that usually portrays when it comes across as that way, when you seem to understand the question in real time and you can respond to it, be personable, but also relate it back to football very well. I think that's kind of just a good sign of a guy that, again, just kind of gets it. So I think Trip McDuffie really stood out to me and just like his ability to probably pick things up pretty quick, get on the field, start to make plays. You kind of hear Andy Reid talk about him a little bit. You can tell Andy Reid likes, like Andy Reid likes the person and what he can do on the football field a little bit, but he's never going to share too much of that. So like, I was really impressed with uh, the presser, but I was really impressed with the presser that Trent McDuffie put out there. We obviously don't get to see much, but I, I did like what I heard from him and the fact that they are working him on the outside and inside, I think is specifically emphasizing outside, I think is something we all kind of wanted to hear. I, uh, a guy that I thought really impressed in his interview was Isaiah Pacheco. Uh, Pacheeks for those who who Listen aren't up to date on yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, you know, a running back out of Rutgers gets to wear the number ten. Um, wearing this number ten, I know Maddie has a problem with that, but you know, obviously, you're going to get questions about Tyreek Hill wearing that number, and so soon, I feel like he handled all of those ridiculously well. You know, he's his own guy. Yeah, I'm going to be my own guy. I'm going to show up. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do all this stuff. You know got praise for his pass blocking and you know picking up that sort of stuff already and talking about how he's you know basically been texting with Patrick Mahomes you know making sure that he's on the same page with him that that's all good stuff that you want to see out of a later round rookie out of a guy that we liked a lot of and he's got juice but he's got to be on the same page to get on the field in those crucial passing down situations where he's going to be at his best I feel like he showed up ready to work. I feel like he showed up ready to answer all of those questions that were going to come up about him and about what he can do. I thought that he was pretty impressive on the podium as well. I got high hopes for Pacheeks, but you know, I, I feel like that he started off on a really good foot. Uh, yeah. to him, I was going to say, listening to him talk about blocking for Patrick Mahomes is a lot of fun. Oh. Like the fact that that comes across... Again, like we talked to him at the East West Shrine game He's down passionate. in Las Vegas, and he talked about blocking. Then one of his favorite plays was blocking a defensive back, a cat blitz on fourth down and pancaking a guy to see him come across another interview and talk about it again. Like it's not lip service. It's not for fun. This is something that he does care about. So like just it was cool to see him go into that specifically to protect, you know, Patrick Mahomes talking about that kind of that feeling and what that would mean to him was was really cool. Yeah, he seemed very grounded understood what his role is going to be and what's going to help him, you know, make this football team and be a, a real contributor. And I think another guy that I thought kind of had similar um, mentality in, in some of his comments on, uh, on his press conference, Nazi Johnson, uh, the seventh round pick uh, at a Marshall, it seemed like a guy that had a good idea of, you know, what is going to be required of him uh, to, to make this team, you know, being versatile, having a variety of skills, being able to show, showcase you know a, a diverse skill set special teams like it feels like he has a good grasp and a good understanding of what's required of him and honestly i think that's a pretty pretty big case across the board like i feel like this entire draft class is coming in with a phenomenal mentality um you know it's, it, it, obviously a little bit of it's a lip service it can be lip service but at the same time nothing about what these guys have put on tape says that it's not true you know, I think the tape backs up a lot of the commentary that these guys have put out there when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, their roles, their assignments. I, I think they, they've all they've all they've all shown on tape that they are what they're saying. And so I, that's such an encouraging thing uh, across the board to all 10 of them, I think, you know, have, have shown that in some way, shape or form. So. Um, though, yeah, those are some of the guys that I think, you know, that, that's interesting that, you know, we kind of all have our own perspectives there. Um, we got some undrafted free agents, you know, too, that, that were able to get to the podium. Justin Ross got to the podium. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of people are really, really excited about him and his potential. Um, and you want to know something guys? I bet he sticks. I bet he sticks. Justin Ross out of Clemson. We have seen the hype videos. Now, the Chiefs media is pushing these hype videos, the Twitter account, everything. We are seeing just about every route that he could possibly run 
out of Justin Ross. They clearly have high hopes for this kid. He's out there. He's really showing his ability. His health is a major thing, and he's showing that he's out there participating in every little bit. He could be an ex-receiver of the future. Guys, I bet Justin Ross sticks on this Kansas City Chiefs roster as a featured wide receiver. Maybe not this year, but next year for certain. I bet he sticks. I think he could be an absolute still in undrafted free agency, just like the clubs behind me are an absolute steal. Sticks golf clubs are a fantastic value. If you're like me, I'm loading these puppies up for a golf trip this weekend. I'm just telling you, I love playing with these things. Someone that has fallen in love with golf the last couple of years, you know, my golf journey needed something like sticks golf clubs that were going to come in and help me have a better quality club. I can be more confident in than, one of the you know one of the lower grade sets that I had when I first started, uh, they've been absolutely wonderful. They've been very helpful to my game. And if you're looking for a set of golf clubs, go to sticks.golf. Promo code KCSN10 will get you 10% off your set of clubs. Make sure you're taking advantage of that. Justin Ross, I bet he sticks. Uh, Maddie, like one of the things I one of the things I think about with Justin Ross, uh, is it him or Josh Gordon? Like that that's something I'm actually having in my head. Like, and I'm not even sure I'm confident Justin Gordon's making this team either, if I'm being honest with you. But I don't think there's room for Justin or Josh Gordon and Justin Ross on this team. You don't have space in this team for multiple other wide receivers to not play special teams, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm assuming this is an assumption that at least Juju Smith Schuster isn't playing special teams. Uh McCole Hardman is only returning, so he's not gonna be a gunner or a vice. I think you could probably convince Sky Moore as a rookie to maybe do it, but like there's and then Marquez Valdez Scantling, I feel like it's a little bit more of a wild card. I don't think he's gonna play. I don't special think he's teams. going to. I don't think so, but he's in that price range wow. where you might be able to ask him to. Like you might be able to, right? But like you're getting a lot of guys now that are kind of at the point where your receivers kind of have to play special teams. Justin Ross isn't going to play special teams. You can't with that injury, not just the neck injury, no. but the foot injury. Like you yeah. can't ask him to go down and make tackles. You're not going to ask Josh Gordon to play special teams. Like, and maybe you could. Although, I did hear he's up to like 240 pounds. Is he switching yeah. to tight end? Like, what are, we do, what are we doing here? <laughs> what, what are we doing at 241? That's yeah. like 20 pounds heavier than anybody has any business being a wide receiver. Like, this is Traylon Burke's weight in Arkansas here. Like, what, what are we doing here? Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Those two guys kind of feel like they're battling out for a spot, but I wouldn't be completely amazed to see somebody with more special teams value beat out both of them, if I'm being brutally honest. Because you got to have guys that play special teams. Like you just, you have to. Now, I will say this. The Chiefs have invested, the Chiefs media team has invested a lot into Justin Ross clips. Yep. A lot. You watch all of their official, their one, they release official Justin Ross stuff. You watch like their camp recap. He had more plays, more clips than anybody else there. That includes your first round pick, George Karloff, this year, first round trade up and trip McDuffie, and like anybody else. Like he had more clips. I'm not saying that says a lot, but it might say a little something on kind of where they are. You add that to Andy repeatedly saying he has no restrictions in terms of his health, which I think matters a lot. I don't know. There's some momentum, I think, building for him to make this roster this season. That special teams question is always going to be my holdup, though. That's the thing. Like that, We just listed five guys that probably aren't playing gunner for mm-hmm. this team. Uh, you know, McCole Hardman, Sky Moore might, you know, return kicks, have a little bit of ability there. But five players that aren't going to be gunners. Dave Tobe uses a lot of these guys as gunners and i mean like we we evaluate these positions we know that tobe is going to get his guys on the roster there are going to be a certain number of positions that he's just going to get and frankly brett veach is probably going to be a little more you know conducive to that this year he said in his presser you know that they wanted to improve the floor with special teams they got to have guys on the outside that can play gunner so unless you're keeping all of these dbs which that's a that's a question mark as well unless you're keeping all of these dbs you gotta have a wide receiver or two that can play teams and now we're talking about so many guys that don't so it is a bit of a confusing element of that but i justin ross is making this team guys i i don't think that there's any two ways about it i think that he's going to make this team i think he's going to get better as the pads come on 
I, I think his body type is yeah. is very, you know, it it is not to reuse a word or conducive to, you know, putting the pads on, playing physical. You know, that's what he did in 2021 when he didn't have the same movement ability. He was able to play physical and still be effective. So if he's already showcasing some of the things that you would hope that you get out of him without pads on, you're going to put pads on. He's going to beat up some of those cornerbacks and he's going to be able to go up and make some plays. I think that he's going to win the job because I think he's one of those rare guys that when the pads come on and rookie mini camps over, he actually might improve and take it a step further. Well, and athletically you got a little bit more time farther away from those injuries. We'll see what he looks like in July. I think that's going to be a big mile marker for him. I think what's interesting to me guys, when it comes to the re receiver room is, I mean, <clears throat> there's not a ton of receivers that have a ton of special teams chops on the roster right now right like mm -hmm. at all so it's all. like I'm, that's what's so fascinating because i mean Corey coleman no omar bayless i mean, they, I mean they i'd rather gary Dieter, who was probably their best special teamer that was in the, he wasn't in the a great room. special teamer either because he, he couldn't stick around best, long though. enough yeah like omar like and, and that's why i'm kind of looking and you're going down the roster if if the chiefs keep omar bayless for his special teams ability over Justin Ross, I'm gonna be upset. Corey Coleman's not gonna play special teams. Dory, okay, Fountain. but how are you? How are you fixing that issue, right? Like, if you're in charge, how are you fixing that issue? Because the oh, Chiefs hold, are hold, 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 hold on, hold on. That's Marcus Kemp's music. <laughs> and that's what I'm, and that's what I'm saying. Though, like, he's Chiefs coming back, fans, dude. The Chiefs fans, and this goes back a lot of years, especially with this particular team, have like this this nightmare about the Chiefs wide receiver decisions. But like at some point in time, like it, you do have the field of special teams unit, right? This team is yeah. going to emphasize special teams. And right now you look at this, they lost so much special teams play. And especially at wide receiver, where are you getting it from, right? Like I, Cornell Powell. Advantage Cornell Powell, I think. I think he's the guy with the best special teams. Okay, but chops right are now. you mad if he makes it over Justin Ross then? Mm, I I know yes, yes, I am, but at the you same better time, be if you're I, mad about Bayless what, making it for the special teams value over Cornell or over I, Justin Ross, say, you better be if yes, Cornell Powell does too. I am, but what I will say is I don't think they're gonna keep two special teams only guys because I think that they've tried to squeeze they've tried to squeeze um, you know, they they squeezed Darius Fountain onto the active roster, and like he had no business being on the active. Like I, I'm sorry, I don't want to mm. dash everybody's hopes, but like he's he's right. Just but a we're guy. talking about a unit that also lost to Marcus Robinson and Byron Pringle, who played well. By Demarcus Robinson backed off a little bit as his role grew, but guys that played special teams mm. a lot, you got to replace those snaps somewhere. You can only put so many DBs out there over and over and over again, right? And like that's why I said. Maybe with a guy like Sky Moore, who we might not talk. I just talk on him briefly here. We'll take a little sidebar and go back mm -hmm. to special teams. He didn't get to practice much at rookie camp. He was limited because of a of a mild hamstring strain. Your boy right here today, mild hamstring strain. I'm currently sitting with an ice pack on my hamstring too. So we're one in the same right now. <laughs> you and Sky. Oh, I, I, I've, the, I've always said you guys are exactly the same. One in the same right now, but he didn't get to practice much. I liked his interview. I think he came across as, again, like Trent McDuffie, he kind of seemed to get it a little bit, but he didn't get to practice. He's a guy that you might force to play on special teams because somebody has to. Somebody in this wide receiver room has to, or you're going to get Doris Fountain and Cornell Powell are going to make it over guys that we think have more receiving ability. Like you have I, to fix that somewhere. I don't, I think you can upgrade Doris Fountain's special teams ability because he really was like, that's what I'm saying. It's like, he wasn't a factor in special teams in any real way when he was on the roster either. That's why he didn't make the team out at, at the beginning at on, or that's why, that's why he struggled, you know, to find the field or be active. It was like, I, he was the guy that's like, why is he still on the active roster? I don't know. So uh, here, before we move off teams, real quick here, how many offensive players do you think are going to play teams? Because it's, it's not going to be, you know, it, we're talking punt return, obviously not, you know, Pacheco or anything like that. I think Pacheco could, yes. He might be the only running back because is Clyde going to play teams? Probably not. Ronald Jones is definitely not playing teams. Mike I have another one. And Mike Burton's playing teams. I I don't know why I got ready to Fortson, say Mike Burton, Bell, Noah Gray, all are, but not the same roles that we're not talking the about for these way. other positions. Right. Like he's not a four core guy, you know. Correct. And so I I think that I think that the offense you might be largely punting 
on their special teams contribution and saying, I see hey, what our, you did there. Our defense <laughs> is going to be taking care of the gunners. They're going to be taking care of a lot of this stuff. And they're just going to stack the room with maybe a whole bunch of young guys that have played a lot of teams. And I, I mean, they've drafted a lot of young guys. There's a lot of young guys on the roster, but that might be something to consider when you're mapping out your 53 here and you're looking at the quarterback room, linebacker room, you know, you might have to add a couple more to that just for teams because the offensive side of the football isn't going to contribute in the same way that it has in the past. Well, there's there's a linebacker that I think could be a very strong special teams player, make this roster and potentially be a contributor on the defense. In fact, I bet Mike Rose, the linebacker out of Iowa State, I bet he sticks. Man, Mike Rose, that's a guy that's definitely, if he makes his roster, he's going to play special teams. That's that's the kind of stuff he lives for. He operates super well in space. He's fluid for a 245-pound you know, guy that has some length. So whether he's playing special teams, whether he's making plays on that side of the ball, or I think there's a chance he might start to eke into some of those dime reps. I think he talked yeah. about in his presser learning how to call plays. That was something he did say. That was something he wanted to do for this team. He's a guy that could leak into that dime roll. And there's a guy that has a lot of coverage reps. He played in the slot at Iowa State at 245 pounds a lot. He did a lot of coverage stuff, dropping into deep zone, shallow zone, playing man-to-man coverage. Not a ton of experience in the box, but if you want to look for a guy that's going to one-to-one replace Ben Demon as a four-core special teamer and as a dime linebacker that's smart, that kind of understands football and has some coverage chops, Mike Rose is a guy that can absolutely stick to this football team yeah he may not have a ton of experience in the box but if you are getting experience in the tee box go check out sticks golf look i am a guy that fell in love with golf in the last two years and sticks was exactly what i was looking for when i was looking for my next set of clubs in my golf journey uh they have been an absolutely wonderful set it's my second set that i've got and the performance on them will 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 blow you away. I promise you, they're the best value in golf. You can get a really quality set of clubs, and you can get them at a discount. KCSN10 when you go to sticks.golf will get you 10% off your next set of clubs. You will not regret it. I have not regretted it, and we will not regret talking about Mike Rose in May because that is a guy, Mike Rose out of Iowa State. I bet he sticks. I mean, like, here's, here's the thing. I we we I mean I, what we do we put like a fourth or a fifth round grade in, on him in the KCSN draft guide. He's a big guy. Like he meets that fourth round grade. He has that requisite. I'm trying I'm trying to figure out why he didn't get drafted. Like I'm trying to understand why he. Didn't I've gotten get this question, and since you know I did his write up, I I feel like I can come up with this. Um, he's a 245 pound linebacker that didn't run particularly well. I think he ran around a four seven, maybe a little bit higher at a pro day and has legitimately played less than like 100 career snaps as a box defender. He played the Dorian O'Daniel role without being as good of an athlete. But here's the thing. He was he was good at it, like, right? Like, he was good at it. And you're not talking about, I I don't want to talk down about Brent Venable's defense, but sometimes there's certain positions in that defense that can be hidden. They can be given the, you're an athlete, go run around role. That seems to where O'Daniel lived. Mike Rose had to do a lot more for the Iowa State defense, that three safety stuff that is constantly switching around for Matt Campbell and everything. I think he understands football. He understands coverage. He just understands the concepts a little bit better. But you're looking at a big, not elite athlete linebacker that never played in the box, that's only a coverage guy that runs about a 4-7. It's maybe a hard guy. You're kind of trying to fit a square peg into a little bit of a round hole. But like, you had a six foot four, 245 pounds, over 33 inch arms. I mean, it's come a on. Big, long linebacker that had that's, like four or five interceptions last year. I was in saying, that, year. that's Steve Spagnolo's music. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are listening, but that's that's Steve Spagnolo's music right now. Like, he's he's full of, I'm sure that when Mike Rose hit undrafted free agency, the first guy that Steve Spagnolo was was telling Brett, you got to go get that guy right there. I I need that guy. And it just makes it smart dude, long, really big, has some coverage skills. They need a guy like that on this roster. We talked about micros before. It just makes sense because he offers something to this team that they don't currently have while still fitting you know, the size and length profiles that Steve Spagnolo typically wants 
from his linebacking court. They got the athletes there. They've got guys like that. We obviously all hope that Willie Gay Jr. is taking that dime role. Maybe Leo Chanel is going to take that Sam role. Mike Rose is going to be one of those dudes that's just going to float around, play special teams, and maybe eke himself into some dime linebacker, some coverage reps there. That makes your linebacking core better having a guy like that that can fit into a Steve Spagnuolo scheme where he doesn't have to rely on you know a four or five athlete all the time even though they've got a couple of them but you know they don't have to rely on a guy like that to play coverage and call the middle of the defense well it's like I mean okay so uh, a big long decent athlete that has coverage chops like what are we like I just when you simplify it down to that like Okay, I'll uh, Mike Rose's relative athletic score. Do you know what it was, Matthew? I have no idea, but given his size, like I don't think it would be bad. Like I don't think it would be a bad score. I think we're looking at probably in the eights. It was a nine oh seven relative athletic score. He was he had a four point two short shuttle, a sub seven three cone. Uh he, maybe he's he, an edge rusher. <laughs> mm. I mean, he's almost there with the size. <laughs> Him and I mean, Leo are just gonna keep bulking up. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, Leo's like, got to add some length to those arms. Steve Spagnolo covets this size and density at the at in his front seven, but this guy can actually cover and he has length to disrupt the passing lanes and did. Oh, and he was the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. Like things just don't completely add up to me with Mike Rose and why he didn't get drafted. I'm sorry. I agree. No, I agree. I gave you my yeah. best explanation, but I, I had a fourth round grade on him. So I certainly don't understand right. how he ended up on draft. <laughs> And like that's a fourth I, round that normally would probably he probably was in the, around the top 100 players for us. Like he's probably pretty close to a top 100 grade overall, being a fourth round grade, maybe you know, top 120 ish. So I don't get it either. It's just my best explanation is he's a guy that didn't play in the box a lot, that didn't run super fast sure. in today's day and age. Even then, though, I, I think you take a round seven on him because he's a special teams. I think he's a special teams ace. I mean, I you look at this. Did, <laughs> I'm going to say something that's going to sound ridiculously preposterous right now, but if oh, Mike no. Rose makes makes the roster. Do the Chiefs have the most athletic linebacking core in the league? They're it's certainly up there. Up there. It's has got to be up there. up there. All of a sudden, I know people people are going to look at that and go, "Oh, you know, well, they lost Dorian O'Daniel. Dorian O'Daniel was a seven four two relative athletic score." 7.42 and it was his athleticism was always a little over over it was because he bit. weighed 12 pounds i was gonna say he True. weighed 223 pounds yeah he was fast as hell on his shuttle and three cone were elite don't get me wrong but he didn't have great explosion he wasn't a very you know heavy guy i mean he was his weight at 223 like that is teeny tiny the chiefs have these very dense athletes at the second level all of a sudden it's a weird thing to say coming off of a steve spagnolo you know linebacker group you know it was recently as three Bad. years ago yeah where we were looking at it, we're like man none of these guys can run with anybody now all of a sudden you're talking about three guys that can you know, run with a lot of guys not everybody in the league certainly but like mike rose can run with a tight end like this is he's perfectly capable of running and covering a tight end here. And then you got Willie and Leo, Leo Chanel, Chanel that can run with running backs. I mean, it's wild to think about what the Chiefs have done with the athleticism at linebacker. Well, think of how much that could help Nick Bolton too. Oh, you absolutely. Know? I mean, if you've yeah. got, if you're surrounding him with some length and some athleticism across the board, that's really going to do wonders for him and let him continue to have a lot of success doing what he's very good at. Uh, and maybe not asking him to do as much as some of these other guys might be able to do from the coverage perspective. Like that could really help complete that group. Now, Leo Chanel has got to get better in coverage. <laughs> he does. But, but I mean, you know, yeah, think got, about it. You got two guys on the outside of Nick Bolton that can cover more ground. Nick Bolton doesn't have to cover as much ground in the middle of the field if that happens. And that's, you know, that's a net positive for, for him. Everybody, so yeah. I, you know, it's great. Did you have more, Maddie? I thought you looked like you're about to jump in. I I was gonna ask there. It, we kind of got off offense, but I wanted to ask if there's any more offensive players we want to talk about. I mean, like I think Darian Kennard's playing right tackle, right? Like we all feel yes. pretty confident that he <laughs> yeah. is at least starting starting his Chiefs career as a right tackle. 
Um, I don't think there's any way to say things are going well, not well, anything about that. It's just a guy, he's going to play right tackle, right? That's a right tackle competition move right there. I don't know if that says something specifically about Lucas Niang's outlook or health or team standing with him, but you are now adding at least another body into that right tackle battle. All right, there's a, yeah, there's a, I think there's another offensive player that we probably need to talk about Ooh. really quick before we get out of here. And it's a guy that was listed as a running back wide receiver and mm. kind of had a unique skill set. And I put a very draftable grade on, which is why I bet he sticks. It's Jerry and Ely, the running back at an old miss. And look, he's kind of a unique player. I don't think he's your traditional between the tackles type running back, but when you put him out in space, he did a lot of impressive things and he's coming from Ole Miss where they gave him a little bit of opportunity to catch the football, got to do a little stuff out of the backfield there. But when you put this kind of guy in space, he's dynamic and he can make people miss. There's some, you know, your ears are perking up maybe a little bit from a special teams perspective. Maybe there's some mobility there in the return game that he could potentially develop. Brett Veach is talking about how, Hey, you know, a lot of these skilled players should be able to track the football catch the football securely and make some guys miss in space that this is a guy that has that kind of ability. He's kind of a gadget player, but the chiefs have found ways to utilize gadget players like this in the past, which is why maybe he got that running back wide receiver designation, similar to a DeAnthony Thomas. Only this is DeAnthony Thomas. And as an undrafted free agent, a unique player that could potentially carve out a specific role with his unique st- skill set. Jerry and Ely, the running back out of Ole Miss, I bet he sticks. If you're looking for golf clubs, you should be looking at Sticks Golf Clubs. They are an outstanding product. Uh, they they are you know just a high performing club that you're not going to find for that kind of price. It's just with the best value in golf. You've probably heard some people say that it's true. They really are the best value in golf. I, my game has been noticeably better since I got Sticks Golf Clubs. So go to sticks.golf, promo code KCSN10, get your set of Sticks Golf Clubs. You will not regret it. Uh, Jerry and can't, Ely. Can't, what? buddy. What? You sticks in my heart. Oh, <laughs> thanks. That was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I bet you. Kudos to you for sticking with the bit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, this is, hey, look, I'm team sticks all the way, man. I'm literally, I am this weekend. I'm going on a golf trip. I that's, I mean, that's how, that's how, that's how much, uh, <laughs> that's how much I've uh, gotten into golf and how much I've gotten into these six golf clubs, which have performed wonderfully this year uh, at St. Andrews when me and BJ went uh, at, uh, at uh, Bally high. Uh, I played Firekeeper in Topeka a couple weeks ago. It was awesome. So, yeah. Uh, and you guys, any thoughts on Jerry Neely? He was fun at Ole Miss. We'll see what it translates yeah. to. Um, okay. Here's a guy that I could see playing special teams a little bit. If mm-hmm. you wanted to force in a DeAnthony Thomas-like roster spot for a guy that is only playing special teams that can count as a running back or a wide receiver, depending on how you want the numbers to look, He's a dark horse for that exact reason. I mean, legitimately, that's the only reason I think he makes the team. But it's an option, right? Like that's that is one option. I mean, he he did have you know some success, you know, as a kick returner. I you know we we've seen Dave Tobe carve out that role for guys, and we've seen him kind of testing some guys. I mean, Pacheco caught some of those. They've talked to talked to a couple different guys about returning kicks. I could see a guy that's just a dedicated back for that purpose, potentially making the squad for for that. And I mean, he he's a hell of one. So I mean, like he he was all SEC for it, and that that's hard to do. There's a whole bunch of really good athletes. So you look at a guy like that. You look at the body type. You think about okay, there's a potential gunner. There's a potential guy that can return some kicks as well. And you know, I just think that. I think he makes some sense. I just, when we start counting the numbers game, as I just talked about a little bit early in the show, when we start cutting the numbers game and the offensive contributions to special teams. I think we expect that they're going to keep a lot of offensive linemen again, especially a lot of you know tackles, giving a lot of guys an opportunity there. They're going to keep a lot of receivers. We know that they're going to keep a lot of tight ends. They seem to really like this tight end room. So keeping an extra running back just for return capability is going to be rough when you know that you've got to keep some extra guys on the defensive roster, you know, kind of at the bottom of it to round out the rest of your special teams. 
Yeah, and we talked a little bit about the offensive side of the ball. Probably should focus a little bit on the defensive side too, Matty. Any thoughts that you got coming out of the, the camp? Yeah, we talked about some defensive backs up top. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of DB stuff coming from a rookie mini camp. They're not going to show you many clips of that. They can't really go one on one. Like, there's not a lot you can do. But the rumors, the the grapevine, George Karloftis and Malik Herring were apparently completely yeah. unblockable in the drill type stuff they were allowed to do, which I believe is team stuff. Like they, uh, Andy Reid said they had to get George Karloftis to slow down. His motor was running too hot, which I am not shocked is, by. Yeah, <laughs> you're not surprised that, at all. <laughs> right, it, and it wasn't, and it, I don't mean this either way. It wasn't that he was so good that they couldn't do anything. It was just he was trying so much harder than a lot of other people were because that's who he is. They had to get him to slow down. Now, I've seen some of the clips. We've seen some of the stuff. It sounds like he was pretty impressive. It sounds mm -hmm. like he did stand out. Now, part of that was maybe going 110% for a rookie camp. But also Malik Herring, uh, a second-year player out of Georgia, was also apparently looking quite well down there. That kind of makes sense for a, I believe he was a senior, maybe even a, a super senior or fifth-year guy out of Georgia when he came out. Now he's got another year in the NFL strength and conditioning program. Like It kind of makes sense that he would look physically better than some other guys, but those two guys apparently stood out quite a bit in this camp. I mean, that's good news if you're a Chiefs fan, I think. Yeah, definitely is. I mean, Malik Herring is a big dude. You know, he's 6'3", 280. He's a big old dude. You know, it was more of a rotational guy at Georgia. But, you know, with, with Trevon Walker back, before Trevon Walker. Like, yeah, he was a little bit. But, I mean, he's a bad athlete, Trevon Walker. Right. Yeah, he, he kind of was. And, I mean, that you know, looking at sacks at Georgia is like, it, you don't, just don't do that. Don't, <laughs> don't try and do that. The way that they rotate those guys, that's just – that's not what you should look at there. But I thought thought he was a very productive player. I thought he was a pretty decent run defender, you know, for for an edge position. So I I was always looking at Malik Herring as maybe a you know sort of a base down kind of guy. But now you've got George Karloftis, and of course my man is going a hundred and ten percent. Like you you turn on his tape, that's the thing that jumps out at you immediately. Whether you know whatever you're looking for, it's hard to look past the fact that he just doesn't quit you know he's always going a hundred percent of the time and yeah you know we see some of that stuff where he's rocking guys with his hands a little bit i 1000 percent believe that he and leo chanel are throwing hands at full speed at these guys without pads on i i really do i think that they're so amped to be in here that they're probably fully throwing hands at some of these offensive linemen that they're coming up against i i would really like to know if we got to see Darian Kennard versus George Karloftis, like the two of them just gradually pissing each other off more and more and more. I, I, I think that's a really good competition there. And I think that that brings out a little bit more of the competitive nature. We know some of the defensive players on this team are going to show up. They're going to talk even in training camp. They're going to raise the level of competition. I think George Karloftis is going to show up and do it as well. We see sometimes these rookies come in, you know, these guys that are really trying hard, you know, veterans kind of just brush them off or something like that. You know, ah, I mean, you're not making the team rook or whatever. George Karloff is making the team. This is a first round draft pick. So <laughs> he's going to get a much longer leash with those guys. I fully believe that he's going to get a much longer leash with the rest of the players on the team. So it might be a little bit contagious and it just makes me more excited for camp. Oh, camp's going to be insane this year because there's going to be so much energy and hype around guys that we really all haven't had a chance to get eyes on. Um, I mean, and just the overall complexion of this team. And it's a very competitive roster because there's going to be a lot of young, hungry guys fighting for opportunities to make this 53-man roster. And Malik Caring is one of those guys. Like, I, I think he's, you know, the, I think that the Chiefs very obviously had uh, intent, <clears throat> intentions of trying to keep him around because they strategically kind of held him back last year to try to hold him and give him that, um, you know, give him that uh, kind of red shirt year. They did the same thing, I believe, with like a Tim Ward and a Darius Harris guys that they've tried to hold on to in some capacity. It's the same thing with Malik Herring. And Malik ha Herring had some relatively big fans last year in last year's draft. Maybe not, you know, high day two, but like some people had some late day two love for him some you know early day three love for him uh he wound up going undrafted with his injury and and yeah i mean maybe the chiefs wind up being the be benefactor he certainly is a big guy uh out there on the edge so that's definitely someone to keep an eye on anybody else that you want to talk about maddie or is that about it 
I think that's about it. You're not going to get much out of linebackers. Kind of like DBs, you're not going to get much out of linebackers. Uh, Brian Cook, similar to Sky Moore, was limited um, because of a shoulder injury. I will say this, though. Brian Cook's going to play a lot of special teams reps, number one. Uh-huh. And number two, that's a big old safety right there. Yeah. Like, Brian Cook is a big safety. If you look at that team photo, he's right there on the end, and he's he's taking up a lot of space for a safety. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if he's lining up on the second level, there's going to be a lot of times as I'm watching the defense before I get used to his number that I'm going to be like, which linebacker is that again? Because he's oh, just, maybe. he's a big dude. Right. And like, I mean, Willie's at 240 ish, 245. Nick yeah. Bolton's at 240 ish. Leo Chanel's at 260, apparently, right now, according to their, their thing. And then you got Brian Cook, who's listed at 210, which is still a lot for a modern safety. And he looked a bit bigger than that. It's like, that's a that's a lot of dude in the middle of the Chiefs defense and a lot of guys that are explosive and can run. So like that's fun. But I think that's probably all I have from rookie minicamp, unless you guys have something else. No, uh, I know you want to play a game and I'm scared. Oh, so. yeah. yeah. But game's <laughs> a loose word. It's a game like thing. Um, there's no right or wrong answers, I don't believe. You'll find a way to make my answer wrong. I'm going to win. Craig's going to win. Okay, so it's now a game. Um, we are gonna play the Chiefs 2019 draft game, and you guys are gonna tell me what the outlook is for each one of these players as they enter their contract year. Now, the reason this is kind of fun right now is because early this week, Brett Veach got on with Florio and they were talking about McCole Hardman's current contract situation and how they really hadn't tried to do to you know, negotiate much because they were going to wait till the end of the year. And that's smart by McCole Hardman and his agents camp. If, if this is the case, I'm not saying true, false. Because wide receiver contracts are you know going wild, yeah. presumably his usage will rise now. But Cole Hardman also tweeted out tonight in response to a poll asking if he should be extended that the results, you know, said that the Chiefs shouldn't. He said, please repost the same poll in the middle of the year and we'll <laughs> see how the results change. So he feels like fans are going to want him back. So we're starting with McCole Hardman taken 56th overall as the Chiefs traded up to get him in the 2019 draft. The Chiefs have not only signed two free agent wide receivers to potentially start or play significant snaps this season, they drafted Sky Moore, who likely is going to play in a similar capacity in similar areas as McCole Hardman, and they did it with an even earlier pick in this particular draft. So what do we think the outlook is for McCole Hardman moving forward beyond this season? I think that he's going to have a similar sat line to last year i think he's going to get more opportunities i don't think that sky Moore is going to come in day one and have those same sort of you know reps that tyree kill has now abandoned here i think we're going to see mccall hardman get an initial crack at it that doesn't mean that sky Moore won't play he's definitely going to play but i think mccall hardman's going to get the same sort of touches that we've seen him turn into you know a couple of decent yardage seasons now and i think we're going to see him operate you know a little bit more on those goes deep overs things like that that we've seen tyree kill run as well and i can see avenues to where teams maybe try and focus on some of the other guys try and focus on juju smith schuster travis kelsey maybe even marquez valdez scantling or try and load the box if the chiefs are running i can see mccall hardman getting free a couple more times just because it, not that he's an afterthought by any means but he's not going to command the same attention that a tyree kill will so maybe he gets open a few more times i actually expect him to have a pretty decent little stat line this season even if he doesn't get the same number of targets so Kent, do you think that do you think one that it means anything that the Chiefs went out and immediately took a wide receiver that's going to play in the same space as him going forward? And two, what do you think his outlook is beyond the 2022 season with the Chiefs? Uh, beyond 2022, I don't think he's a Chief in 2023. I think this team is managing and navigating the wide receiver market differently than they were three months ago or two months ago when Tyree Kill left. Um, I do think he's going to have a strong year. I think he's going to have his second best yards per catch of his career. So he had 20.7 in 2019, 13.7 in 2020, and 11.7 in 2021. I think someone's going to look at him, uh, and he's going to have a he's going to have he's going to average 16, 17 yards per catch this year. Maybe not as much manufactured touches, but some more opportunities down the field. Uh, and I think he's going to get paid decently by some team that wants a more vertical stretch type player. 
And I mean, he's, he's going to yeah. price himself out of Kansas City probably. I think he winds up with 700, you know, set, uh, around 700 yards again. I don't think the Chiefs pay him. I think that he goes and finds somewhere else. I could see a similar so- sort of scenario to MVS in Green Bay that they let him walk. That they that's were just a like, really listen. good. That's a good comp. Now I I think that Nicole Hardman, based on what has happened to the wide receiver contract after the Chiefs, the wide yeah. receiver, yeah, you know, market. After the Chiefs have signed MVS, I think McCall Hartman's going to get paid more. But well, I can definitely he'll he'll see. be younger too. I mean, he'll only be he twenty five. He'll be twenty five yeah. during free agency next year, and so that'll help him too. I think he'll get paid and a little bit, bit healthier than yeah. MVS. Uh, yeah. So I mean, like I, I can definitely see him coming out, and much like the Packers let MVS walk, I can see the Chiefs saying, "Listen, we're just not interested in playing in that market with you." You know, good luck. Go make your money like Charvarius Ward this past year. Not you know they may like him, but they may not like him that much. So you guys don't think that drafting a wide receiver that is also going to play in the same general roles is means anything? Like you don't you guys just don't. I'm not saying you guys said that. Just does that mean anything to you guys that they came out and spent a top fifty four pick? on Sky Moore, who's going to play plenty out of the slot. And when he mm-hmm. is lined up outside, it's going to be as a flanker, as a Z wide receiver, which are the areas where McCall Harvey is going to play. Like, that's what I'm saying. I think he's telling? gone. I think okay. McCall's matters. gone. Yeah. Oh, it yeah, absolutely 100% matters. matters. And I think he's gone. I think. And I, I can okay. see Sky that. Moore taking more and more of those reps as the season goes along sure. for certain. I mean, he yeah. talked about it. Sky Moore talked about it in his presser, you know, at rookie minicamp about how, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that I, yeah. that I got to adjust to here at the NFL level and Andy Reid's scheme. I think that they'll lean on McColl early for a lot of the snaps. And Sky Moore talked a lot about details. I'll tell you what, he might be more detailed than McColl Hardman is. Even I, though listen, McCall I get Hardman's it. I get it. Maybe years. he's holding himself to a really high standard here. Maybe that's <laughs> all that is. But I do see a scenario where McColl Hardman right. gets more of the snaps because he's been in the office Maybe. for a long Oh, time. yeah, I think it'll start that way. I just wanted to – and so I'm continuing this trend. Juan Thornhill, a safety mm. taking in round two at pick 63 overall. The Chiefs just took Brian Cook, a safety out of Cincinnati at pick 62 overall, so one pick earlier. What do we think the addition of Brian Cook means for Juan Thornhill moving forward? Through I mean, What is the pick, Kent? What does Brian Cook's addition at the same general draft spot as Brian Cook from the 2019 draft, stop, Juan Thornhill, you mean. draft mean for Juan Thornhill this year? Uh, I mean, it, it means it hits his last year in Kansas City, and I think it's going to really put him in a very difficult bind uh, to get opportunities here. Uh, it seems like there has been some diminishing um, opportunities for Juan Thornhill. It doesn't seem like he has been able to get the same kind of opportunities and, and, and be able to play uh, the way he was uh, before his injury. Ever since his injury, things have not gone the way that you know he probably hoped or the Chiefs hoped. And I don't know the underlying issues that would have kept him off the field. He doesn't look like the same level of athlete that he used to. That's probably a little bit of it. Um, you know, that's he doesn't look like the same guy as consistently as he used to not the best tackler like those are some things that that probably are playing into that factor here and so i think he could lose some opportunities to brian cook a guy who is going to tackle i think that there is a high chance that juan thornhill by the middle of the year is back to just that dime safety role steve steve spagnolo has over the past two years when healthy even has consistently tried to replace Juan Thornhill with Dan Sorensen. Brian Cook is a better player than Dan Sorensen. So I I don't know if he's going to be able to get the mental side of it down at the NFL level and the speed of the game down as quickly. But I can see with the way that they've talked about Brian Cook and his intelligence and the way that we've seen him, you know, stay deeper than the deepest and, you know, read routes out of bunches and everything like that. Like, and the tackling ability, I can see Steve Spagnuolo saying, that guy's going to be playing in my nickel, period. I need him to play in my nickel. I can see Juan Thornhill being relegated to a dime role, which you know all but spells the end of his you know time in Kansas City in 2023 and beyond. Okay, so I, I find something a little interesting here, just knowing you guys. I got one more player I do want to get to, but I got to touch on this. You, we as a group, but it's you too, since you guys are answering here. I know you guys like Juan Thornhill's game as a safety when you like McCole Hardman's game as a wide receiver. I yes. also know you like Sky Moore's game as a receiver than you like Brian Cook's game as a safety. How mm-hmm. come we feel like Brian Cook is going to eat more into Juan Thornhill 
then Sky Moore will eat into McCole Hardman snaps and production on the year. I I can say this explicitly. Andy Reid trusts McCole Hardman more Does than he? Steve Spagnolo trusts Juan Thornhill. I, I'm not saying it's a high bar to clear. Yeah, right. I'm just saying, you know, it, it, Steve Spagnolo stuck with Dan Sorensen through arguably the worst stretch in his career. And that was for a reason because we saw Juan out there. It's not like he was limping through. There was something that wasn't happening. I don't want to speculate. I don't know what it is. And maybe whatever it was has been cleared up between the two this offseason. And maybe that changes. But the last thing that we really knew of last year, it took Dan Sorensen just consistently playing so badly that they could not leave him on the field over Juan Thornhill. It wasn't anything that Juan Thornhill was doing on the field because he was fine. Dan Sorensen was playing so poorly, and they still chose him over Juan. Well, and I think the Juan Thornhill that we all got excited about isn't there anymore to some level, sad. too. And it's sad. It is sad. I mean, he looked like on the verge, like he looked like a first, he looked like an extra first round pick mm -hmm. in his for in his rookie year. Towards the end of his rookie year, he was outstanding. And then the injury happened. And so there's a little bit of that. It's hard to play as a rookie in uh in, in Andy Reid's offense, too. Like there's a little bit of that. Like there's there's a lot of factors here at play that I I mean, I, it's not a great apples to apples comparison. Um, because I do agree. I, I you know, I, I do agree, like. You know, I like Sky Moore better than I like Brian Cook. You know, <laughs> so right, no, um, and that, that's just I just wanted you guys to expand on that because for, I'm sitting here and like I I get what Craig is absolutely saying in terms of the trust that somebody may or may not have in Juan Thornhill. I also look at the Chiefs getting Byron Pringles involved as humanly possible over McCole Hardman, and sure. I look at them but, still yeah. relying on Demarcus I'm, Robinson in specific. Sure. You're telling me that McCole Hardman can't go right up and run a post corner? on a quarterback with his speed, but they trust Demarcus Robinson to do it. Like there's who, a lot of who situations. ran one of the best post corners in the league. Let's I guys, mean that man. Guys, I'm hey, just, I'm just saying we're saying that Andy trusts Hardman more, but like, does he though? We saw his role reduced down the stretch to a very effective, a very efficient role, but it was highly limited. It was a lot less than every other receiver was doing. Yeah. I just don't know how much they trust them. Um, I want to do a quick one. Rashad Fenton taken in round six, 201st overall. Joshua Williams, Jalen Watson, Izzy Johnson, Lonnie Johnson. A lot of corners brought in quickly because there is one in cap to this game. So quickly, what do we think Fenton's role is this year, Craig? Kent, you'll tell me what this outlook is going forward. I think that I think he's going to play serious snaps early. There's too many young bodies. And as we had talked about earlier this week, you know, talking about James Bradbury, I think Rashad Fenton's got the inside track towards playing for this team. What remains to be seen is where he's going to play. We, we all like him on the boundary. It seems this team does not want him on the boundary. And if that's the case and he's just playing in the slot, that's where it makes more sense to bring in Alani Johnson and Lajarius Sneed a little more in the slot. So I think that, you know, at least initially, we're going to see him maybe play a little bit in the nickel, mostly in the dime when they bring on an extra defensive back, have him play more of like a safety role or something like that. But I think it will be a little more sparingly this year than we've seen him in previous years. Well, and I I think he's I think he's back next year in 2023, though. I think this is the kind of guy that, you know, he, you put him in the box. He, he's a he's a stabilizer for your roster. He plays some special teams. Um, hey, there's some special teams potentially for you right there, Maddie. Um, I, I think he's a guy that you kind of hold on to. You try to hold on to a little bit. The consistent guy that, you know, that, that has played, you know, a decent amount of snaps for this football team. Kind of like Ben Neiman, Daryl Williams. Like, I think he goes on that similar trajectory. I think he signs a one-year deal. I think he's valuable to the Chiefs. I don't know how valuable he is across the board to every other NFL team, but I think he's a guy that makes a couple million dollars in 2023 as a member of this football team. Uh, I don't think it's a big contract, but it's probably like a one-year deal. Uh, and it's similar to how Ben Neiman they extended their they you know they kind of extended their stay a year. Seems like something the Chiefs have done. I think that's something that we could see. Like that's that's the path I think Rashad Fenton's on. For reference, though, if, if just special teams, he played by far his least amount of special teams reps last year. And I know, sure, but himself, like I think this like year, 50 
Yeah, yeah, but I think there's less offensive or the less defensive yeah. burden this year. No, and he I think can. that gives him opportunity. He, he absolutely can. I just he just definitely saw a downturn. Okay, so this is the this is the end of it right here. Um, you have to extend one of these guys for three years. You have mm. to franchise tag one, so pay him one year a lot of money, and then you get to let one walk. Oh, I'm I'm this one's easy for me. I'm I'm going to uh pay Juan Thornhill for three years and hope that he recaptures some of the athleticism. I am going to franchise tag Rashad Fenton. And I'm gonna let I'm gonna let McCall Hardman walk because I think that the money that you have to allocate to McCall Hardman in either a three year deal or on the tag is just gonna be so deep that i think that you let him walk and get the comp pick for him oh yeah uh why we're gonna get so many people mad at us why would you put the franchise tag on mccall hardman (laughs) oh man because Um, maddie made us that's why (laughs) i'm gonna put the franchise tag on juan thornhill because it's the cheapest probably (laughs) okay i'm gonna maddie answer it and I think that's, that's the fine. cheapest franchise tack. I'm going to extend Rashad Fenton, and I'm going to let McCool walk. Okay. That's okay. the cheapest route I think I can take in this game. Because I okay. don't believe in any of them to be uh, – I, I just I don't have a ton of belief that they're like cornerstones that you want to make big investments in. But like I think that's the route you have to take. Craig, the magician wins because he kept the better player for three years over the lesser player. So, I mean, that, that's that's the end of the game. I'm glad that we we found a solution to this. I I am happy that you guys participated in my little game here. I, I thank you all contestants for coming down. Um, it was a joy to have you guys here. But um, the absolute correct answer was extending or re-signing Juan Thornhill to a three-year deal. Um, franchise tagging Rashad Fenton for one more season and then letting McCole Hardman walk. So why don't you I just, appreciate it. Why don't you just close this thing out then, Maddie? Just you close this out today. I, no, I I'll tell hurt. you what. No, I'll tell you what. I think that I should close it out just like our good pals at McAdoodles are going to close out every liquor store in Kansas City when they come to Lee's Summit, Missouri this summer. The best selection, best prices, the best customer service. Our pals at McAdoodles have it all just like I have it all after winning Maddie's game. That's going to do it for the KC Laboratory. Thank you all for joining us. Like, share, subscribe. Give us five stars on Apple or Spotify. And we will be back with a schedule preview show after it releases on Thursday. 